2013, the delegates gathered all of, coming from all over South Africa and decided to form this organization. They formed this organization because they said the ruling party was suffering from ideological zigzags and open dominance of neoliberal right-wing politics were characterizing the ruling party at the time. The ruling party was suffering from lack of integrity and credibility and it was alienating anything that was advancing a left perspective. The trade union was compromised. The Communist Party was compromised. The youth movement was killed. The Women's League was co-opted into the agenda of neoliberalism. South Africa at the time was characterized by a kleptocracy where those who were aligned with the government of the day could not face prosecution for their corruption. We observed all of this and decided that we cannot sit back and allow the continuation of the deterioration of state of affairs in our country. And inspired by the Cuban 26 July movement, decided to form an organization on the 26th of July 2013 and called it the EFF. So we thought as we celebrate its 10 years today, we must and share some few moments with the international community, which gets to learn about the EFF from a hostile neoliberal media, which creates an impression that the EFF is an organization that is characterized by violence, but is not different from all other anarchist organizations, that the EFF cannot be relied upon because it is not based on anything tangible. But members of the diplomatic committee, you should know that the EFF is a Marxist, Leninist, and Fanonian organization, meaning we subscribe to the ideological and theoretical framework of these scholars and revolutionaries in terms of how we seek to forge a revolution and govern our society. We are an internationalist, radical, militant, a non-sexist and a pan-Africanist organization, and we operate under the principle of socialism. The EFF is a leftist, anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist movement with an internationalist outlook anchored by popular grassroots formation and struggles. The EFF is a vanguard of community and worker struggles and will always be on the side of the people. As an organization, we take lessons from the notation that political power without economic emancipation is meaningless. As a result, this movement is inspired by ideals that promote the practice of organic forms of political leadership, which appreciate that political leadership at whatever level is service, not an opportunity for self-enrichment and self-gratification. As we already mentioned, we draw inspirations from the broad Marxist-Leninist traditions and Fanonian schools of thought in their analysis of the state, imperialism, culture, and class contradictions in every society. EFF is a South Africa's movement with a progressive internationalist outlook which seeks to engage with global progressive movements. We believe that the best contribution we can make in the international struggle against global imperialism is to rid our country of imperialist domination. For the South African struggle, the EFF pillars for economic emancipation are the following. Expropriation of South Africa's land without compensation for equal redistribution in use. Nationalization of mines, banks, and other strategic sectors of the economy without compensation. Building state and government capacity which will lead to the abolishment of tender system. Free quality education, health care, houses, and sanitation. Massive protected industrial development to create millions of sustainable jobs, including the introduction of minimum wage in order to close the wage gap between the rich and the poor, close the apartheid wage gap, and promote rapid career path from Africans in the, for Africans in the workplace. Massive developments for the African economy and advocating for a move from 
reconciliation to justice in the entire continent. Open, accountable, corrupt, free government and society without fear of victimization by the state agencies. Over and above, pillars, the EFF commits to further pillars to complement the seven. They are equally important pillars and are presented here, not in order of importance and vitality, but the recognition that they are equally important. We believe in decentralized special development and building new cities, public representatives using public services, reduction of benefits for public representatives, progressive internationalism, the development of sports, arts and culture, progressive views on the gender and sexuality question, meaning acceptance of different forms of gender and sexual expressions, consideration, considering the rise of right-wing politics, which form the basis of electoral opportunism all around the world and now in South Africa, the EFF has a progressive view on the immigration question, and we believe that we are all global citizens, especially in Africa, where borders were created from colonial conquest and divisions created in the Berlin Conference of 1884. As the EFF, we believe in monetary and fiscal stability, which is anchored on industrialization and deliberate state intervention in the economy. As many of you may know, South Africa is in the depth of an energy crisis, so one of the complementary pillars include prioritizing of energy, security, and the environment. We must take this opportunity here today to inform the international community that we are not party to the agreement made at the COP27, where the South African government conceded to an experimental exercise known as a just transition, which will result in the abandoning of a coal as an energy source in South Africa and the closure of our coal power stations. Additionally, in terms of complementary pillars, the EFF believes on a need for a keen focus on the development of science and technology as an anchor of development in Africa. We believe that there must be support given to research, innovation, and enterprise development. Understanding that South African special planning is rooted in colonial pacts and the sharing of our land by our conquerors, we believe in making one city the administration and legislative capital of South Africa. As things stand, our country's legislative capital sits in the city of Cape Town, while our administrative capital sits in this city of Tswane because of colonial pact between the African colonialists and British settlers colonialists. This must be reversed. Finally, we believe in the transformation of the criminal justice system, that our correctional centers must be rehabilitated instead of creating worse hardened criminals. Members of the diplomatic community we could speak at length about our organization, its history and its policies, but as you are all aware, we have a 10th anniversary rally at FNB Stadium where we'll expand much deeper on who we are and what we stand for. We hope all of you will be in attendance to experience the festival of the poor. Fellow global citizens we must, however, touch on some key international issues that require our attention. And first and foremost, we must speak about the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. It must be understood that as the EFF, we believe that the conflict between these two nations must be resolved, and it must be resolved peacefully. We want to make it categorically clear, however, that we believe the conflict arises because of NATO uncontrollable desire to infringe on the territorial integrity of Russia by setting up military capacity on its borders. That is the genesis of the conflict. It is the breaking of treaties that were adopted during the fall of the Soviet Union, and that must be condemned as much as we may condemn the war itself. We have noted the communication from Cyril Ramaphosa's office that Russia President Vladimir Putin will not attend the next month BRICS summit in South Africa. It is our understanding that President Putin's withdrawal is a consequence of South Africa state's reluctance to be firm on international affairs and their inability to resist pressure from NATO to arrest President Putin. South Africa is at the current stage that by an individual who cannot take a firm position on any matter 
even if his life depend on it. We therefore want to caution all nations represented here today, especially members of BRICS that South Africa is currently led by a spineless government that will never meaningfully take forward efforts to grow the strength of the global south and its allies. Any effort to fight against imperialism, the calls for de-dollarization and for an alliance that will place BRICS nations on a stronger footing in the globe will always be undermined by a cowardly government in South Africa. Members of international community, we hope that countries such as China and India will, in solidarity with President Putin, not allow their presidents to attend the BRICS summit. Because what South Africa did to President Putin, it's a serious humiliation of a sitting president. And in solidarity, and as BRICS members, heads of states of those countries should also stay away from attending BRICS because South Africa's foreign policy and its sovereignty has been undermined by NATO forces and the USA. Members of the international community, we take this opportunity to call for a meaningful solidarity with Palestine. Under the EFF government, there will not be the Israeli embassy in South Africa until there is peace in Palestine. We must not just pay a lip service when people are dying in their numbers. The people of Palestine continue to suffer unspeakable human rights violations and their land is annexed constantly. Their children are murdered. Their sites to practice religion are destroyed while the whole world watches. I say so because we are the beneficiaries of international solidarity ourselves. If there was no international solidarity support to South Africa, we're not going to be where we are. And this is our turn to also show support to all those who are being oppressed by other nations. We want the people of Western Sahara to have their land back without any interference by Morocco. But Morocco and Western Sahara should exist as brothers and sisters and not see each other as enemies. We're asking for peace and long-lasting solution between Western Sahara and Morocco. And that peace should be characterized by the release of the land of the people of Western Sahara. We must not fear intimidation or loss of funding simply because we are too scared to condemn the crimes against the people who violate the rights of others. We want to make the same call with regards to our friends and comrades in Cuba who suffer under the yoke of trade embargoes because they dare to be socialist. The trade embargoes against Cuba must be lifted as it is inhuman to punish a nation for taking different ideological leaning with regard to how they run their society. The Cubans helped us fight for our liberation in Africa. They continue to help the whole world with quality health care interventions. And they don't send soldiers to go and bombard other people's nations. They send doctors to go and save life and make sure that our people receive the primary health care. We are calling for an end to ideologically inspired sanctions by nations in the West that are used as a tool to undermine the sovereignty of nations in the global South and Africa. We call for lifting of sanctions in Zimbabwe, not that we agree with the, people, with the government of Zimbabwe or the president of Zimbabwe, but it is the people, the ordinary people of Zimbabwe who are suffering under these sanctions. And we want the sanctions lifted and we want the people of Zimbabwe, particularly those who are in South Africa, to return back to Zimbabwe and make their own determination as to how they want their country to succeed. But that country will never succeed under the sanctions. Africa has been independent for more than 60 years. Yet we experience challenges of development even after six years of independence. 
The Western countries cannot live without African continent, using our fellow African brothers to destroy ourselves. We want peace in Mali and welcome the dropping of French as an official language in Mali. That is one progressive movement. Doesn't mean French cannot be spoken, but to say we have conquered the imperialists and colonizers and continue to have their languages as official languages is self-imprisonment. We call for peace in the land of Thomas Sankara of Begina Faso who paid the price of his own blood by the coup orchestrated by the Western. We call for peace in Sudan and reconciliation of the Sudanese people. We are tired to see the silence of the international community towards the continuous bloodshed in the Eastern DRC. The Western countries supporting some neighboring countries in DRC to destabilize the Eastern DRC. We shouldn't find it exciting that African countries can fight amongst themselves with ease, especially fighting around territorial expansions. Africa is one country, it's not even a continent. These borders we see and we experience here in our continent were imposed on us by the imperialists. No African brother should derive pleasure out of killing other African people. We say this because we are advocating for one Africa with one currency, with one legislature, with one military and one president. Because we believe that these small pockets of countries are the ones that make international communities undermine Africa. Just imagine one president of Russia or America calling all the presidents of all countries to their countries to be addressed by one president. We see that as belittling and undermining our continent. We believe that if we have one currency based on our mineral and natural resources, we, it will be one such a strong currency and it will place Africa firmly on the international table. Here in South Africa, you must be rest assured that next year we're going to elections and we're going to take power. And there is no coalition that is going to be formed because the EFF is going to be a government alone. We require no one to come and be part of us because the ANC is corrupt to the core and cannot be salvaged. DA is racist to the core and cannot be helped. And the rest of other political formations are formed by multinational companies to protect their interests in this country. It is the Oppenheimers, the Ruperts, who put their money behind certain black faces to create an impression that there is an emerging alternative and sponsor those non-existing political parties with millions of money so that they can continue their control of South Africa. The EFF, since its formation, has never dropped. It is the only organization in South Africa that has been growing. And even the latest research shows that the EFF has surpassed the ANC in the Western Cape and in many other provinces of South Africa. So you can be rest assured, you are not talking to a government in waiting here today. You are talking to government in Ikuruleni uh, Metro. You are talking to government in Nelson Mandela Metro. You are talking to government in Johannesburg Metro. You are talking to government in Etequini Metro. You are talking to government in Mogali City um, um, Municipality. So. When we say to you that we are taking over government next year, it's not a rhetorical question. It is a clear a declaration based on a scientific research conducted by people who are not aligned to the EFF. So next year, be rest assured that all of you who are here who may be hosted in a different place just next door here. 
uh, where the government sits. So we want to take this opportunity to really thank you for accepting our invitation and thank you for showing up this morning. Uh, it has not been easy for us. We had our dinner last night. It has been a very busy week. And tomorrow we are at the FNB Stadium and you are all invited. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Commander-in-Chief and the President of Economic Freedom Fighters in Africa. The EFF is not only in South Africa, we have EFF in other ca uh, countries in the continent. Some of them you'll see them tomorrow. And there is an EFF in Namibia which is already in Parliament. So it's a very radical and a growing organization which is resonating to, with a lot of people in the continent and the diaspora. Now we're going to move to our next item, which is question and answer session. I'm going to take five hands in the first round. We may ask any question or clarity or suggestion that you have. I'll take the first round. Looks like a president was very clear. <laughs> Okay, um, on my right hand side, the first table, one, uh, there was a hand. There was a hand somewhere here, where was it? Where is number two? There is number two. Where is number three? Number three is over here. Is there any other hand? Okay, let's move like that. Oh, number four. Let's do this. You will be number three and you will be number four so that the mic moves seamlessly. Thank you very much, number one. Good morning. Thank you very much, Mr. Malema. I'm David Guy. I'm the Australian Deputy High Commissioner. Um, Country? Australia. Australia. Um, my question is, if you don't win a majority next year, what would your approach be to building coalitions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Number two. Thank you. My name is uh, Han Peters. I'm the ambassador of the Netherlands in this country. Um, I think without any doubt, the energy crisis is top of mind for most South Africans. So what's the plan of the EFF for ending load shedding? Thank you. Thank you very much. Number three. Uh, Mr. President, my name is Håkan Juhl, the Swedish ambassador, and uh, since EFF is known as an international movement, uh, I would like to know more about your closest allied on the European and Asian continent when it comes to political movements that you share values with. Thank you very much. You may move over to number four. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, the invitation that we got from the EFF Amandla Pangwa from the, uh, as an insection of the Fourth International, we're an international organization. My question is just, uh, we, we, we've heard the CIC is talking about the war that is happening and currently in Africa and our next door neighbor, we're having a war happening in Cabo Delgado in Mozambique which at this moment we can say uh, most of these countries that have come here, they are available there. If they avail their military presence, of which it's 34 countries, and most of them are there as combating terrorism, yet we know that it's about economic freedom because the youth of Cabo Delgado is fighting against the exclusion in terms of economic uh, 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 exclusion. But then I want to ask, the EFF that 
how are they supporting that struggle? My second question is that we, yesterday we just had the, the Panya Panya moment, mm. which was the, the Panya Zing moment, which was promising young people stipends instead of permanent jobs and sustainability in the country. The third last question is that as the EFF is the most formidable organization as the Fourth International, we have proven that through research and everything. How is it uniting the left? Because we know the left is arrogant and they living in their illusions. And we really, really, really plead with the EFF that you, can you really help them? Because they haven't come up into terms with reality that the EFF is coming into power. And when we're in a government in waiting, you need to be very patient with these poor souls. How is the EFF going to garrison that? Thank you. Thank you very much. Over to you, President. Thank you very much. Um, with regard to the coalitions, um, our, our preferred approach would have been that we should consolidate all the opposition parties and then establish a new government and remove the corrupt ANC which has put us to where we are, all of us. But the problem is that you have a, an opposition parties that say we should come together to the exclusion of the EFF and there's no reason why. Um, because we, have, we are not just saying we want to work with the opposition. We gave the opposition power in the metros in 2016 against the ANC, we are the ones who removed the ANC. That's how much we have demonstrated our commitment to bringing an alternative government in South Africa. But the oppositions, when it was now the turn to include the EFF, they excluded the EFF. And worse, at the local level, because at the local level, it's not more about ideological questions. It's more about service delivery to our people. We can be Marxist and Leninist, can be right or left. But when people need clean water, it has got nothing to do with the ideological question. Deliver the water. And we are the only organization that have no public representatives that faces serious charges of corruption, of lack of integrity, of um, having sex in offices. None of our councillors has ever been found to have done that. Uh, you can't accuse us of having involved ourselves in any corrupt dealings in any municipality, yet we are not wanted. Why? So when you leave the EFF out, you leave it with no op. You are actually pushing it to the ANC uh, 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 when coalitions come. And that's why we have opted to engage in the concoction you see in Johannesburg, in Igrulain and everywhere else because it, the, the ANC said, come here. We said, no, we're not coming. We're bringing everyone who can work with you. We would rather work with you through other people, not you directly. And that's why we have not given that responsibility, which is a huge responsibility of mayorship to the ANC. Would rather give it to any other person other than the ANC. So we find ourselves in that situation. Um, we can end load shedding um, in South Africa. Firstly, you have to fight corruption. Uh, car power ships were signed a long time ago to come and intervene. But wives of ministers and ministers wanted to get their hands in, in those deals. And without them being involved, the deals fell flat. Mozambique has got a number of megawatts to provide to South Africa. As long as they don't have their hands in that, they will never approve of Mozambique's intervention to any additional megawatts to the grid is something positive to South Africa. And we are a nation with a serious crisis. We shouldn't even be thinking about ourselves 
as individuals, we should now be thinking about um, how do we get more energy into the grid and not about more money to me and my family. The coal power stations that were decommissioned will recommission them. Because you can't decommission a power station for green energy that gives you less than what that power station was giving you. It's illogical. We are all for green. We are all for clean energy. But not at the detriment of the economy of South Africa. We cannot destroy our base to appease USA and the UK. Let's, if the green gives me 2,000 megawatts, whatever I'm going to decommission should be giving me 2,000 megawatts or even less. So I know I decommission this one and the alternative is this one and therefore I don't run short of what I'm requiring uh, to sustain the economy of South Africa and to give our people a reliable uh, electricity. So we also are going to stop this thing of taking out our clean energy, I mean our clean coal to outside countries and leaving us here with a dirty coal and being told we are polluting. The pollution, whether it happens in China, whether it happens in the UK, whether it happens in Germany, whether it happens in the USA, is going to affect us even here in South Africa. So why is there a story that we must not use coal in South Africa, yet we see tons, millions and millions of tons being taken out of South Africa? Where are they going? The story should not be, let's, de let's, let's decommission coal power stations. The story should be, coal because it's not clean and it's not good for the environment, let's stop mining coal at all. So no one uses coal. It can't be that South Africa must not use coal, but other people are using coal. It's wrong. So there's no coal that is going to live here. We're going to make sure that we produce enough and reliable and clean coal and we'll engage with our own allies in the form of China and all of the, to come with new technology to deal with emission. So we need to make sure that that which we say other people must not do, we don't do ourselves. Because to ask of us to self-destruct and use us as an experiment in exchange for money and to killing of our people, because this load shedding has killed a lot of people here in South Africa, has killed a lot of businesses here in South Africa, and you can all feel it. Yet, we must be the first ones to be used as an experiment. You need a very firm leadership that will prioritize the interest of the country before any other thing and not sell the country to the highest bidder. Our alliances are naturally the leftist countries. China is one of the countries we look up to. Um, Cuba is one of the countries we look up to. And uh, Russia, we've got historical ties with it. We know that Putin is not at the left, but is attitude against imperialist forces um, finds resonance with the EFF and those are the kind of people will rely on. BRICS is one such a structure that we regard very highly and uh, we see uh, the emergence of BRICS as an alternative platform to engage in the geopolitics. And those are the type of uh, progressive structures that the EFF uh, will align with. We, we make no apology with our alliance uh, with China because we believe that China can help us even with load shading. Um, 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 uh, we need a government that has got interests and that negotiate good terms and say to China, build it, operate it, and hand it over to South Africa. The Chinese will never refuse to do that. They've never refused to do that. But because we are hell-bent at our alliances with the West and America, we've missed opportunities to strengthen our own um, uh, economy through fostering working relationship with countries that will not 
uh, destroy. China is not going to colonize Africa. The problem is your corrupt leaders who go to China with empty bags and come back with money. They want money and they negotiate with money in their mind. So you, you come to me like that, I will also dribble you. So go there with proper ideas, not with corrupt mentality. There's no China that wants to colonize anyone. How, how do you get colonized now when you are the negotiator? South Africa has surrendered a port now in, uh, in Deben now. That's colonialism. Where you just take your port and give it to other people, surrendering your sovereignty, and later you are going to say people have colonized you. When you go to China and say, give us a power station in exchange for our Tambo airport, why would they miss that opportunity? It's not them, it's your stupidity as leaders. No one, no, there is no policy of China. We have gone through it many a times that seeks to colonize anyone. But if people go there with bad ideas, it's not a problem of China. It's their own problem. No socialist organization and socialism teaches us that. But we can't engage in imperialist uh, program. We can't engage in colonialist program. We intervene where necessary. And intervention does not mean interference. And that's what in inspires that relationship um, uh, with countries like China and Cuba too. The Cubans, you go to them, you seek solution, they will provide it. And then they don't say, give us this, give us that. It's South Africa that says in exchange we'll give you this. And when we give the Cubans the money that we are giving them, when we get accused, we over-explain ourselves that which we offered to the Cubans. The money to Cuba is not necessarily to pay for the doctors. It's a solidarity fund. We are in solidarity with Cuba and will double that money when we take over government. Because Cuba did not give us money. It gave us life. People died fighting for our democracy. Why should we be told by people who oppressed us that Cuba joined us to fight against how we must relate with Cuba. We cannot allow that. Um, the, the war in Mozambique is exactly what I spoke about. But the problem, you are right, is this foreign interest that are interfering and even sponsoring the killing of each other in, in Mozambique. We should not, as Africans, anywhere, because we are rejected, we are hated everywhere. We should not find it easy to fight with each other. It must be the most painful and the most difficult thing for an African to take up guns and shoot at another African. Because if others can do it, they will do it with easy. It must be difficult for us. We are hated everywhere in the world. We are treated like we are not human beings. Why should we treat each other like that ourselves. That's why the EFF here in South Africa is told every time that we won't vote for you because uh, you want foreigners in our country, you protect foreigners in our country. So be it. We're not going to kill Africans in exchange for votes. I will rather stay at home in the villages because that is not just us. So we are for Africans and Africans everywhere must always find African solution to their problems without Sassol's interference, without France interference, without British interference. We need to sit down and find solutions of Africa by Africans and not this borrowed uh, uh, um, interference that we see all the time. So we are, we are aware of what's happening in Mozambique and we will make sure that the government of the EFF finds an African solution which is going to be permanent and not driven by foreign company or multinational companies' interests. Well, um, um, uh, Panyaza is doing what he has to do because he can see that the ANC is in danger. He's trying to, to save it. That is an act of desperation. Um, uh, uh, and it's not just an act of desperation, but also humiliation. 
you are seeking a job, you are told to come to the stadium to come and to get your, 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 your appointment letter. You must all queue there uh, 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 to get in and all of that. It, it doesn't, it, it, there's no, I must the moment, doesn't have dignity in it. Yeah, and, uh, and I think, and I'm happy you are raising it because our people should see it for what it is. It's an act of disparation. Uh, the last kicks of a dying horse. They are very dangerous. Uh, that's why they are doing what they are doing. They are on their way out and they will do everything to clinch to power. But it's too late uh, in the day. They are out. The ANC rules Houting with 50.1% as we speak now. So they know that there is nothing they can do uh, that will make them win the elections next year. So they, they are going around hiring people, and then the next thing, if they don't give them stipend, even that stipend they are not getting. Uh, because there's a huge fight that people have been hired and they are not being paid. Because procedure is not being followed. And because you don't follow procedure, you are going to humiliate these many young people who are hungry uh, for jobs. The unity of the left is very paramount because capital is united. Uh, capital is united against the working class and the working class should come together. The left should come together. It's the business of the EFF to unite the left. And we're going to be very patient with them because they are coming through. Uh, they are coming to realize that the only way to get the leftist perspective taking over this country is through the EFF. And uh, um, uh, like you said, um, it's not an easy and ideological position. It requires a lot of patience and a lot of explanation. And we'll bring them together and ultimately will emerge and become a better uh, country under the left forces. Thank you. Thank you very much, President. Uh, I'm loving people today, and I will go for the second round, uh, which is the last round of questions. I will start on this side. On this table, you are number one, number two, uh, number three, number four, number five, number six, uh, seven, eight. Like that, number one. Yes. Uh, the mic is not on. Thank you, okay. President. And uh, it was a pleasure to listen uh, to you. Uh, my name is Andre Zapaiki. I'm the ambassador of the Central African Republic and uh, dean of the African Heads of uh, Mission in uh, South Africa. Uh, I have just a few questions of clarification. As being an uh, African myself, I focus on African uh, uh, issues. Since I've been in this country now nine years, I've seen uh, some evolutions, particularly in the relationship between how foreigners are perceived. In this country, we have moved slowly. We have now gone to the Dudula movements and uh, many uh, other movements in, in this country. That's one thing. But also, President, you have, you have, we see also what's going on between uh, Africans and uh, uh, dying in the sea and trying to cross uh, the Mediterranean to go to, to, to Europe. So I don't know what really uh, the EFF think about this uh, situation of uh, internal the internal relationship migration 
and also the going to trying to go to Europe. Now, when we see, we look at uh, many countries, uh, we see that the president has been talking here about uh, African unity, African one currency, one government, uh, etc. Uh, but there have been very, very little progress made since uh, the creation of the Organization of African Unity, now AU, etc. Um, what is your view about the best thing that we have today that has bring, brought us close to the dreams of our founding father, that is the African free trade uh, area? If tomorrow EFF is in uh, power, or just tell me what is your point of view of it, or about this uh, African uh, trade, uh, free trade area. How can we make this work? Right. I'm sure that you have uh, an idea uh, about it, because this is one, one thing that we have in hand that can really help the African the process of uh, uh, United Africa make a move. Um, also, President, we, people complain that the African Union doesn't uh, uh, work and uh, there are still weaknesses, uh, etc. What do you think about, uh, about it? How can we Today, what can we do to make the uh, African Union a strong institution that will lead, lead the development of, uh, of our continent? I think that is for now what I would like to hear from the president. Thank you. Thank you very much. Number two. Uh, Your Excellency, the commander, I'm president of the EFF, uh, the dean of the diplomatic corps, and the regional deans present. My name is uh, Muhammad Haruna Manta. I'm the high commissioner of Nigeria. My boss has taken the cell out of <laughs> my ship because the first question I had, I have just two questions, has been taken by him because um, the president, in your address, you made no mention, I don't know if it's deliberate, of the AU, as well as the regional blocks, SADC, for instance, in addressing some of the ills, you know, bedeviling the, the various uh, regions. Uh, you did mention some of those forces that try to tear us apart, like it is in Mozambique, but you did not mention anything, whether SADC is doing anything at all, which you appreciate. I would uh, love that uh, you take another look at how the EFF will strengthen this regional organization, or whether or not the EFF does not see the value addition in the AU as well as SADC in uh, the agenda you have for, for governance. The second question I wish to ask is um, on the basis of economic integration, the, the world is seen as a global village, whether from the west or from the east. The emphasis I thought for Africa should be who will be our trading partner uh, and not the, the very radical posture of uh, the socialist concept, which probably was very relevant in the, uh, after the Berlin Conference, 1880-something, 1884-85. But today, uh, we don't have colonialism to fight as such, because the whole of Africa has been decolonized. South Africa is independent, Namibia is independent, and so is the whole African continent, with the exception of probably some aggression against the Western Sahara. 
So if, is it not time that EFF takes a posture that is more uh, inclusive of development concepts rather than uh, imaginary fighting uh, colonialists that do not exist in any way? Because the interest of the world is more virtually focused on how do I develop on an economic concept, how do I attract? Sometimes uh, the development economists call it uh, uh, foreign direct investment, FDI. How do I attract that? So I would like to know what the EFF thinks about uh, the e economic integration of the African continent as well as what the AU has done in uh, promulgating or forming the, the Africa continental free trade area as well as the 2063 agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much. Number three. Thank you very much. Um, good morning. Sani Bonani. Ninjani. Morena Malena. Lekai. Well, uh, first of all, um, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity to have an exchange. I think Abanga uh, Okuti. Okay, uh, name in the country. Name in the country. It's coming. Okay. <laughs> it's very important to have a conversation. Mm -hmm. My name is uh, Andreas Peschke, and I'm the ambassador of Germany. And uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Sia Bonga, for the dialogue and reaching out. Um, there's one thing I would like to mention. I uh, listened to you very carefully when you spoke about the Marxist and Leninist principles of your organization. Um, some here in the room would know I grew up in a communist country. I grew up in a country called the German Democratic Republic, also known as East Germany. So I had a first-hand real experience of uh, real, really existing socialism. And um, so we had all these Marxist uh, theories. I read a lot of Marxist texts at school. We always had Marx, Engels, you didn't mention Engels, mm -hmm. and Lenin mm -hmm. uh, in our rooms as the guiding figures. Uh, we had nationalized everything. We had nationalized the land. We had nationalized the enterprises. But then after 40 years, we woke up and we realized that it didn't work. So the socialism as we experienced it, the communism as we experienced it in East Germany, it simply did not work. So when the Soviet Union broke up, I think we took the destiny in our hands and uh, joined our brothers in Western Germany in order to build a social market economy. So um, I'm just sharing this and um, to let you know. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm happy, you know, because I'm an example. Maybe it's interesting to you. Uh, to speak to somebody who has this first-hand experience, I'm ready to share this experience in more detail of how real existing socialism looked like uh, because we made the experience that it didn't work. And maybe it's good also to try to learn. Everybody has to make its own experiences, but maybe it's also good to learn Ukufunda, Kwamaputa, Kwababengina from other, from other mistakes. So maybe that's something I would like to offer. And a short question on the governance in this country, on uh, forming mixed uh, governments. I think the EFF joined some coalitions in some municipalities. Um, you know, from our outside view, uh, we have a feeling that uh, the mixed governments or coalition governments do not really work so, good, so well at the moment. 
that uh, the uh, the interest of furthering uh, the interest of the people of increasing and improving uh, uh, social services has not yet been reached so what would be your resume of these first years of uh, coalition governments also with the participation of EFF thank you very much Kelly Bo thank you very much number four Hello, Mr. President and Commander-in-Chief. Thank you very much for hosting us for this breakfast and for taking questions. My question is about the day after you become president, once you've become president next year. So you've talked about anti-colonialism and anti-imperialism. Uh, I'm the ambassador of Spain, sorry, Raimondo mm -hmm. Robredo. Uh, the European Union's relationship with Africa and African countries is generally guided. I would say absolutely guided by the priorities of those countries that are aligned with the African Union and with these countries. As my brother, the High Commissioner of Nigeria said, one of the things he requested is foreign direct investment, which I think you've criticized in some way. Other thing is cooperation in peace and security, for instance, in Cabo Delgado, which uh, I think I've heard that you've also critical of that. It's done at the request of these countries. So my question is, what would you do differently and what would be your relationship with the European Union once you become president? What would you change? What would you think we should do differently? And what would you put on the table also as a value proposition for the European Union? Because as you said, uh, we all defend our own national interests. That is something that all diplomats do. So what would you propose to the European Union differently from the value proposition of Africa today, South Africa and Africa? And what would you request from us, how would South Africa's policy towards the EU be different? Also regarding trade, for instance, the preferential trade agreements, TDCA, or AGOA with, with the US, would you change that? Thank you. Thank you very much. Number five. Can I be seated? Can I be seated? No. Okay, good morning. Um, Thank you so much. I've requested if I can be seated, but anyway, yeah, let me start. My mm -hmm. name is Ashi Said Abbaker. I'm from Chad and working with the African Peer Review Mechanism and AU organ dealing with good governance. Um, first of all, thank you so much for inviting us and giving us this opportunity uh, to exchange. Uh, President uh, Malema, uh, just know that you are an inspiration to many young people like me. And to be honest, I, if I watched um, the South African Parliament session, it's because of EFF. So um, my question is that, do you have any program or any plan of uh, best practice sharing among the other African country? As all we know, as I always say that Africa is not poor, but it's poorly managed. Hence, we need to like EFF in each and every country in the continent. The second question is uh, going to be this. You know South Africa is among the top six countries that, uh, let me put it, have a veto in the AU. So what are, what are your vision if become the president in of South Africa, praying that, uh, or hopefully that's going to be soon, uh, to AU, the, your vision to AU to be economically free. Because after six years of its creation, till now, like we receive more than 6% fund from EU or other uh, Western agency. That's my second question. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Number six. Uh, greetings to everyone. Uh, my name is Nomusa from Kasi Broadcasting Africa. Uh, my question is uh, EFF um, had a gala dinner, and we saw so many black, um, white Indians business people. So, do you think uh, our businesses are now warming up for EFF um, government? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, number seven and eight are this side. Number seven. Thank you very much. My name is Lisa Mayahari. I'm a deputy ambassador of Finland to South Africa. I would have a question on um, Russia's war in Ukraine. 
You mentioned that uh, EFF would like to see a peaceful uh, solution to the war for the Ukrainian people. How would you go about about this this war? What, in your view, would be the peaceful solution? Thank you very much. Last one, number eight. Thank you very much. My name is Dian Christensen. I'm the deputy head of mission of Norway in Pretoria. And I don't think anyone said it, but uh, I would like to just start by saying congratulations on your 10th anniversary. Uh, well done. Thank and you. also, uh, thank you very much for inviting us to this uh, event, which is actually very important. I mean, being Norwegian, we are almost fanatical about dialogue. We want to have mm. dialogue with everyone and uh, especially those where we don't agree necessarily, because getting things out in the open is so important and the only foundation which we can build trust and, and a good long-lasting long relationship. So thank you. One question and a comment, and I'll try to be brief. The question is about Zimbabwe. You mentioned the sanctions and, uh, and also uh, how would you go about that, but how exactly do you think that South Africa should engage in Zimbabwe? We have elections coming up. It is very clear to everyone in this room, I think, that the diaspora in South Africa is very significant and also has a very big impact on, on the, the economy and the labor market here, around three million, as far as I've seen from estimates, uh, in the diaspora in, in, in South Africa. How would you think that South Africa should uh, engage with Zimbabwe in order to, to, to get uh, progress in that country for the benefit of both countries? The comment is about NATO and imperialism. Um, I wanted to mention, uh, you know, because many of us here are NATO members, and Norway is actually a founding member of NATO. We were joining the organization in 1949, a long time ago, and the reason is because we were occupied and attacked in 1940. And uh, all the generations of politicians from that day to this have been saying, never again should that happen to Norway. For us, NATO is a defensive alliance. It remains a defensive alliance, and that's our primary motivation for being in it. This has not prevented us in any way in being anti-imperialist, anti-colonial, and we've been supporting liberation movements in Africa every throughout the post-war period, including strong and consistent support for the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa. The problem right now is that we see that uh, the imperialist um, ambitions right now mainly are coming from Russia. And what we see is that the war in Ukraine, the attack on Ukraine, is a part of imperialist ambition of Russia. And also the, the occupation there uh, is, is, a, is a, you could really easily see it as a colonial experiment. I don't necessarily think that you would agree with this based on what you said, but in the spirit of openness and dialogue, I think it's very important that someone raises this point in this uh, forum. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, President. Will talk, eh? Yeah, eh? No, he will. He will. Maybe she will take more. Yeah. Um. Well, foreigners and Dudula, the uh, uh, South Africans are not xenophobic. Xenophobic. That's why structures like Dudula are not growing. It's just a tiny minority, and that is found in a particular corner of a country. Um, we've got nine provinces, 52 district municipalities, and how many local municipalities? 200 and 204 municipalities. And Dudula is only found in Johannesburg, and then and, and in Pinville. And then you want to define that as South Africa. It's not South Africa. It's not us. We are not like that. We grew up with people who came from other countries, and we never had a problem with them. Because our history dates back to us coming from the north down to the south. Each individual you can ask of their origin here in South Africa is going to take you back there where they say they don't want those people. There's an advocate, very popular advocate called Dalimpov. There is a Mpofu in Zimbabwe. So when we fight Mpofu, which Mpofu must we fight? Because they are all the same. They are Tosas in Zimbabwe, they are Ndebeles in Zimbabwe, they are Zulus in Zimbabwe, they are Tswanas in Zimbabwe, they are Vendas in Zimbabwe, the same way they are here. 
So that's what unemployment does and laziness of people who don't want to go look for jobs. They just go forming things here and then they go to shops to intimidate business people because they want to get bribed. And then business people comply with such things of thugs. It's criminals. They can't do anything, nothing. So that cannot be a definition of South Africa. It's a group of criminals who are in cahoots with some ministers, by the way. They are working with them. So we have no time for thugs. There are small boys who must be put in their place. Majority of them is drunkards who were in MK, who could not find deployment, who didn't go to school. Even the ANC can help them. So there is nothing we can do to help them. But they must never define us as South Africans. There is no way uh, we are uh, xenophobic. Um, the, the, the crossing of our Africans into Europe and other countries is exactly based on what I said, the mismanagement of our countries. Because we are not poor. We should be providing solutions. We are a typical example of how resourced we are. That's why you see other nations have left their countries to come and colonize us. We never went to colonize anyone. They came looking for our resources. So if people can leave their countries to come and colonize us here, it should be an evidence enough that we are resourced enough and therefore we should use that resource for the benefit of Africans and not the other way around. Um, there is a reluctance because to create a formidable thing like an African government uh, because everybody benefits from these little cocoons. You are called the president of uh, Swaziland. Prime, was this uh, president, what the prime minister or something? But your country is not bigger than Soweto. <laughs> what is that? Then it means Soweto must be a country also. So, but because they benefit from that, they don't even want to engage in this discussion. Because it's an individual who benefit from it. That's why there's no concrete plan to go into it. And there's no a single president that leads this discussion and put it firmly on the agenda of the AU. That the original thought of the AU as OAU, it was to establish, the founding fathers wanted to establish a solid government. And they got defeated in that discussion. But the intention has always been to create a solid government from its inception. That we should come together and be one. And uh, something came out of it and it never went back to what it was supposed to be. A government, a united government of Africa. And that's what we will advocate for ourselves as the EFF. Africa free trade is a movement in the right direction. But the first thing we need to do, which the AU must firmly resolve, is to do away with the visa for Africans. There should not be a visa for Africans. The same way the Europeans have one visa, they travel everywhere, they are one thing. They, but they, the, what they have, they don't want us to have it. There shouldn't be a visa in Africa. Free movement of people should be allowed. And there is no one who is going to leave Nigeria to come and settle here. It's not true, that thing. It's a myth. I mean, we've got... I come from a province called Limpopo. We don't need visa to go to Johannesburg. But people are still there in Limpopo. They have not left Limpopo to Johannesburg. So visa does... The, doing away with visa doesn't mean automatically people are going to leave their homes to where the economy is prospering. It's not true. Johannesburg, Gauteng is doing much better than Limpopo. But the people are not leaving Limpopo to Gauteng. So why would people leave Lagos to here? For what? It's their home. They will come here, look for what they are looking for, and take it back where they come from. We'll go to Lagos to do the same and come back home. We have a problem here of unemployment of South Africans. 
who are told by the previous apartheid mentality and colonialism brainwashed that South Africa is superior, is better. They've got the best qualifications. They never go out of the country to go and look for jobs in other countries. Why? Why? Why are they not going all out of Africa? We have nurses. We've got, uh, we now we're told doctors. We now have teachers. We have this. Africa is in need of that skill. You going to work anywhere in Africa, in Ghana, it doesn't mean you left your home. It's the same as me leaving Limpopo to come here. When the time permits, I go back home. So what is the problem? Let's go. They, they need to go. The, the continent It's our home. We, we must all go there and become one thing. Once we do away with the visa, we are going to know each other. The reason why we are scared is because we don't know each other. We know each other through the lenses of our enemies. We don't know each other. So we must first know each other if we're going to build the government of Africa. So it's important that uh, we engage in this thing. Free movement of people and goods, it will help us appreciate the existence of each other and bring us more closer for the unity of this continent. Um, well, African Union is a... Um, it's a meeting of friends who don't even call each other to order. They can meet with a dictator who has just, you know, uh, killed his own people and then meet for the whole week and not even mention it. And not even mention it. So we can't allow the, the African Union to continue to work the way it is working. We are talking here about SADC. We have a problem here in Zimbabwe. These members of SADC don't call the government of Zimbabwe to order because it's a group of brothers. That government is violating people there. It has just passed a law of gatherings and speeches and all of that. If they don't like you, you're having a political rally, they just send soldiers, they shoot at you and all of that. No one in SADC has raised his voice to say, but what is this? So, we cannot have these regional bodies and the continental body, including Pan-African Parliament, by the way, which are not biting on countries that are engaged in wrong activities. What is wrong with President Ramaphosa calling President Nangawa to order? It will be coming from a good place. They are all brothers, they are all Africans, they all speak, we assume, for the interest of Africans. So we can't have a situation where we've got regional bodies, continental bodies that become a meeting of elite without concrete solutions to the problems confronting the people of Africa. We have a problem in Mozambique. The problem is solved by sending soldiers. Where have you ever seen soldiers solving a problem? Soldiers don't solve a problem. The leadership must meet and discuss and come up with a binding decision. That's why we say we need one legislature, one military, one currency, one president, so that we know when we go into Mozambique, it's not an interference, it's us providing a solution to our own problems. So we are not happy with how these things are uh, structured. Look, economic integration, trading partners, developmental concepts, we embrace all of that, but it doesn't mean we're ideologically naive. We're not ideologically naive, we're political. And therefore, um, if we were to trade with the USA or to trade with the UK, we trade from a perspective of knowing that we don't share the same ideologies. When you approach them, you know these ones are brutal. I must not sleep on the job. They are not friends. We are not born alone. We are born with people. That's what friends are for. And to have friends that are aligned with you ideologically is nothing wrong. It's not an old-fashioned thing. It's actually apolitical. 
to want to approach politics without ideological orientation. From which ground do you move from? What informs your perspective as a person who is a political animal? It's important always to have our ideolo sharing ideological perspective with China. It doesn't mean you can't get a foreign direct investment from Norway or from UK or from uh, a Germany. No. You always relate with all countries. Foreign direct investment is more than welcome, but on our terms. Not on Germany's terms. No. We have been giving Germany a lot of money here in South Africa for assembling cars. Not for building cars, for assembling cars. Why is Germany not building those cars here? And create jobs here? In South Africa, we have a problem of unemployment here. Germany will not have a problem. It needs leadership that is decisive, that is going to say, look, we are going to meet you halfway, but you have to meet us halfway. Assembling is not enough. Let's start it here and build it here. So, we, we, and Germany's investment under the EFF government is not threatened at all. The same as any other investment. But we are going to renegotiate the deals. And they must be to the interest of Africans. Botswana did it now, where uh, DBS just wanted to change a diamond deal and all of Botswana said it's not going to happen. You are going to trade here and do diamond here on our terms. Botswana screamed, I mean, DBS screamed, kicked, did all manner of things. If this thing is not signed by when, when we leave, they said you can go. But yeah, we are going to sign the deal on our terms. DBS went back and signed. So that's leadership. Investors want to know what is your position on this matter so that they can navigate around it and see if they can still make profit out of it. They are not interested in you or in anything. They are interested in politics. That's why they mine blood diamond. They know people are being killed there. People, this diamond comes from where people are being killed. They still take it. Why do they want to behave like a holy cows and want to punish people for political ideas, yet they don't punish people who are killing each other for diamonds. They go there and still buy blood diamonds. So be clear, then they will come and invest. Even on the land question, we've got uh, FD, uh, special development zones, economic zones here in South Africa, where multinational companies have invested a lot of money on the land they don't own. It's owned by the state. Special industrial zones, special uh, economic zones in South Africa where multinational companies have put billions of rents. They don't own that land. So why, what is the obsession with the ownership of the land? Why do you say when people own, the, when you state own the land, the multinational companies want to invest because there is no guarantee? No, you give them uh, the guarantee that from this period to this period, this is yours, these are the benefits, these are the incentives, this is what's going to happen. Please invest here. They will invest. They have done it now under this government. Why do you say when people don't own the land, there won't be investment? There is a huge development that happened right in front of us. You said, one of you said, was here for nine years. I think uh, it's a dean of diplomatic corps. There's a huge development here in Midrand where there is more of Africa. That land, that big development you see there, that land is owned by an Indian family. When you buy property there, there are no transfer costs. No one owns. They are on a lease of 100 years, those people. Yet they still buy there. Black, white, Indians, everyone buys in a place where they don't own the land. A land is owned by an individual family. They're still in, there's a huge mall invested there in the land they don't own. People are not looking for, for, for those things of ownership of the land. They just want 
a land tenure guarantee that from this period to this period, this is yours. They calculate, they say, we'll make a profit. Then that's fine. Let's go. That's how business works. Who said people fall in love with land? There's no one who falls in love with land. No one falls in love with diamond or gold. They fall in love with money. Anything that can give them money, they will, they will go and invest in it. Um, socialism didn't work in Germany. And you are going to tell us how it failed. But go and also learn from China how socialism works and it has succeeded in China. It doesn't mean if it has failed in Germany, it will fail everywhere else. We are not Germans. We are South Africans. In China, they've got socialism with Chinese characteristics. <coughs> what stops South Africans from having socialism with South African characteristics? Learning from Germany. What worked, what did not work. Take the good things, leave the bad things. Why capitalism always resort to Chinese principles, I mean to socialist principles, every time they get into trouble? When the banks failed in 2008 and put the world into a financial crisis, it was socialist principles that took the world out of that crisis through state intervention. Where was capital at that time? If we go now, we are in Pretoria now, Let's go to commercial crimes or go to liquidation or high court and all of that. Every day without fail, there are private companies that are being liquidated there. Who said if it's capitalist owned or private owned, it's inherently successful? Who said that? So it's, it's, an, it's an ideological debate we can have. We know what happened in Eastern Germany. We know what happened in the Soviet Union. We know what's happening in China. We know what's happening in Cuba. So we can have a, a deeper discussion about whether this uh, is really a way out. We, we sometimes get fixated on concepts, but in reality you do the things that you say you don't want to do. Every time capital gets into problems, the state must intervene. Every time. That's when you now see the importance of socialist uh, principles. Coalitions in South Africa will work. Qua you know, um, but this thing is a new thing to us. We don't know it. And, and we are learning on the job. We are learning on the job. So please be patient with us. We have succeeded so far. No municipality has actually completely collapsed. Uh, to a point of uh, uh, having to be resuscitated by an upper government under coalition. So, it's a new thing. We're learning on the job and we'll get it right. The problem is not coalitions. The problem is the ANC and the DA. They are so used to power. And when they now get out of power into a coalition, they still want to behave like they are in power. Coalition means power sharing. You must let go. Don't behave like you still have power when you don't have power. You must share. And we will make the best a coalition partner because we have never been in power. So we don't know power. Maybe the first power we're going to experience is through coalition and it will be the first experience. But those who are used to controlling power, when it shifts, they are still in denial and they want to behave like they still have power. And it leads into the problems we see uh, in, the, in the coalitions. At the center of a problem is the ANC. It has been in power for too long. When it gets removed into a coalition, it is in denial. Same thing as the DA. That suffers from white supremacy. That in coalition with black people, a white person must lead. That white supremacist mentality is what causes problems for us in coalitions. But otherwise, coalitions will work. And coalitions are the best thing for me. I think we deserve that. Where no one has got an absolute majority, we all govern through consensus. 
and we look at what is in the best interest of our people. Because too much power corrupt. And that's what we have experienced since uh, 1994. The same thing with the European Union. Uh, don't say, what are we going to ask from you? That's a big brother mentality. What are you going to ask from us? Yes, don't say, we, why should it be us who are asking? We're not asking for anything. We're fine. So, let's relate as equals. Not as a beggar and uh, uh, the big brother supplier. No. We will relate with the European Union. It's a necessary body. We'll relate with it. We'll respect it. And the respect must be mutual. And we'll engage on what is in the interest of our countries. Not what is in the interest of the European Union. We're in a mess now. We've decommissioned uh, our power stations because uh, countries like the USA, uh, like the UK have said to us, no, do away with these things. We are going to introduce uh, green energy. Yes, the money and all of that. People took the money. There is no electricity today. So we ought to relate as equals so that no one imposes their ideas on us. We are people that subscribe to superior logic. Anything that is scientific, anything that has been proven, anything that makes sense, will agree with it. It doesn't matter whether it comes from European Union or it comes from BRICS or it comes from China or Russia. No, we will not agree with anything that seeks to belittle us and make us uh, look like we are beggars in this kind of a relationship. So, that's the same with Agoa. You can't use Agoa to threaten us in terms of our sovereignty and our foreign policy. That if you are going to bring a Putin here and not defy will do away with Agoa, you can do away with Agoa, we remain with our sovereignty. Should you strip us of our dignity because we are disparately looking for Agoa? That our foreign policy is now determined somewhere else. Which nation can be proud of that? That our foreign policy is determined somewhere because we are beneficiaries of our goal. It can't be correct. Let, let's, let's trade uh, and have those benefits of Agoa out of mutual understanding and respect for each other's sovereignty and foreign policy. Not that today because we don't agree on Putin, you must withdraw the whole thing. That is puppeting. That is belittling. That is making us look like we are beggars. But let, let's remain with our dignity. Let's be beggars with dignity, not stripped of dignity and thinking that you are what you are not. You can't even make your own foreign policy determinations because Agoa will be taken away. We, 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 we are spreading the wings of the EFF um, we have EFF in Liberia, we have EFF in Lesotho, we have EFF in Namibia, we have EFF in Zimbabwe. We, have, we, we, we are a young organization in terms of age, but already we are finding an expression in other um, African countries because we are trying to uh, take this spirit into other African countries. We need to strengthen AU, give it more teeth to bite. The decisions of the AU must be taken and they must be firm, firmly uh, implemented by countries of Africa if we are going to say this is a serious uh, uh, continental body. Business has no choice. We are the only organization that is very clear of what we want. Uh, and therefore, business in dealing with the EFF, they know what... Uh, uh, um, they are dealing with policy po po position is very clear uh, uh, and we were, we were happy with the response yesterday it was overwhelming we really enjoyed ourselves and the kind of support we received from the South African business yesterday was uh, uh, really welcomed um, black, white, Indians uh, Africans, Kalats all manner of business men and women were there 
uh, to support the EFF. And that's what made the rally possible tomorrow uh, because of the support of these business people who are not scared of the establishment. Ukraine peaceful solution is that Ukraine must not join NATO. That's the solution. So that we, we protect the territory. I mean, Russia doesn't feel threatened. It's as simple as that. And uh, I, I, I sympathize with you. And you, I, I like the fact that you like dialogue. And I like dialogue. We can engage about that. Uh, because um, um, NATO is not a very peaceful organization. You can't talk peace and NATO in one sentence. It's not true what you are saying, because what 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 what, NATO, what peace did NATO take to Libya? Look at what you did to Libya to date, because you are going after one man, you destroy the whole country. So if it brought peace in in Norway, it has not brought peace in Africa. And our experience with NATO is not what you have experienced. And therefore, uh, we, we respectfully disagree with that. I agree with you that um, um, elections are coming and South Africa must play a, an important role. There's a problem in Zimbabwe. There's a big problem um, in Zimbabwe where the rights of citizens are being violated openly and no one is saying anything about it, including South Africa. Elections get stolen daylight by the army. For sure they have the results by now. Me and you are still talking about elections. They are done. <laughs> they have the results. They, those things are a formality. Well, it can't be correct that ZANU-PF holds the people of Zimbabwe hostage. If it means ZANU-PF must lose elections for it to go and self-correct, so be it. But let the people, the, the voice of the people of Zimbabwe be respected. It can't be a win-win-win at all costs. In the EFF, we, we believe strongly that Chamisa won the last elections. And it was undermined by violence that was unleashed on citizens of Zimbabwe. But is the sanctions solution? No. No. The Zimbabweans are suffering as we speak. You know how you negotiate the best terms as business and as countries. Zimbabwe should be open to you to go and invest there, but negotiate the best deals and conditions of such investment. No sanctions must stop you from going to invest in Zimbabwe. Zimbabweans are struggling. And the world must go and help Zimbabweans. Um, you know, this thing of uh, territorial threats, we know them here. We've got an army base here in Botswana. What is America doing here in Botswana? <laughs> Why is Africa not in American borders? What do you call that? And you, you, you come and say imperialism and colonialism is finished. When people expand their territorial expansion through uh, putting military bases at our borders, there is a, a military base here. A study has been conducted that a fighter jet that moves from that army base to the Union building will not take less than two minutes to bomb the Union building. If a war is declared with America, America does not have to assemble any resource from Washington or anywhere else to come here. They are already here. What do you call that? It's democracy. It's free wealth. We must celebrate that and say, no, imperialism is no longer there. It's in our head. We understand what Putin is fighting against because we have it here. Here. What is it doing here? We never went to Asia. We never went to Europe. We never went to America. We are here. We don't establish bases anywhere. Why should you establish bases, in military bases in our continent? And when we speak, it's called uh, uh, old-fashioned politics. That they are out of fashion. There's no such a thing as imperialism. When imperialism is breathing on our neck, yeah. 
We're not going to allow that. We are going to expose that American military base here all the time in the platforms we get and educate our people that this is exactly what Putin is fighting against. America will not allow that. That Russia must go and establish a military base in Cuba with missiles facing the USA. They won't allow that. So we must not be allowed, we must not be asked to accept the things that you will not accept uh, if they were to happen in your countries. And that's what uh, uh, we are talking about when we speak about NATO and peace not going together. So, ladies and gentlemen, those it, it doesn't mean enmity. We are not enemies. We engage robustly. Our policies can be challenged the same way we challenge your policies. We are open for engagement. South Africa is open for investment in our own terms. We know what uh, multinational companies have done to our economy. Coming to milk our resources, leaving us dry. The case in point is a place called Marikana. Just go and see what the London mine did there and what Sibanya is doing there to date. With a huge operation of a mine just next to it, there is no water. There is no tar road. There is no electricity. There are no houses, no proper schools. People are squashed in one place. Yet, a stone thrown away, there is a mine. We cannot allow that to continue as is under the EFF. We want a mind that will benefit our people. Why do people say, no, the state must not own a bank in South Africa? Because there are private banks. Why do you need a state bank? Because they want to continue to exploit people and charge them high interest. Why do you say you don't want the state to be in the bank, but the state is in hospitals? There is private hospitals. There is state hospitals. There is private schools. There is state schools. There must be private banks and state banks. And the private bank, the private hospitals and schools and private everything, even where the state participates, the private sector still maximizes profit, even when there is an option of a state. We will not close them down in the, under the EFF. We'll do what Kenya did. We'll not close private schools. We'll build quality public education where people will abandon private schools and go to public schools like in, in Kenya, where Kenyans leave private schools because public education is better. That's what we need to do. Private schools are closing in Kenya. So we will not close any mine. Why should we close a mine? We are the ones who issue the licenses of mines. We will give a license of a profitable uh, mine to the state-owned mining company, where mining will not cost the state a lot of money, where the mineral resource is close. You don't need many resources and money to produce the product. That license shall go to the state because we are the ones who allocate the license. Why should you close the mine? That's what nationalization means. means a state-owned mining company will be established and shall mine next to uh, the American mining companies. Won't close them down, but will mine in such a way that they will not see a need to continue mining. Because the state will be doing so well and will crush corruption. The biggest problem is corruption. And the Chinese have dealt with it and dealt with it decisively. You steal money of ARVs, money that must go to people who are HIV positive, by going buy medica, um, uh, uh, medication for people who are HIV positive. You steal that money. And as a result, a lot of people die. Why should you be alive? 
after killing people. You deliberately killed people. You knew when you don't give them that medication, they're going to die. What happens? What are the consequences there? You don't get killed. You don't get imprisoned. Yet a lot of people have died. Everybody has, con has concerted that ESCOM collapsed because of corruption. But we don't know who's corrupt till today. But they know there is corruption. Corruption, corruption, corruption. ESCOM collapsed. And as a result, oxygen machines in hospitals switched off and people died. So you are not just corrupt, you are a murderer. So they are saying corruption, they don't refer to them as murderers, they are murderers. They killed people. Yet not a single one of them has been arrested. Society has got no problem of corruption. They want you to deal with it decisive, then they know their consequences. They will run away from corruption. So, that's the kind of leadership we'll introduce in this country where we deal decisively with things that are not beneficial to the people of South Africa. But we are internationalist in outlook. There's no way we can exist in isolation. We need you for us to survive. And that's why we are open for an engagement. No country can exist in isolation. We need friends. And those friends, it's all of you who are in this world. We might disagree on this or that, but what brings us together is humanity. We want to see humanity succeed, and that's what makes us friends. And let's, the door of the EFF remains open for bilateral engagements with individual embassies who seek more clarity, who are there, um, uh, 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 our international relations office is here. Tomorrow we are in a rally. After the rally tomorrow, things are back to normal. At any day, whether it's USA or Germany or UK or Zimbabwe or China or Russia, anyone who seeks to engage us, our door is open. Please, let's come and engage further on many other issues. This is a big platform where we may not go into some of the details but in that kind of an engagement, uh, Dean, I think it will be better to engage more, um, especially that you represent uh, the continent of Africa. Thank you very much.